Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we embark on a three-day program every other day uh, this week on the Black female experience uh, within the context of our larger meta theme uh, for this year on apology and reconciliation, reparations, uh, and uh, forgiveness. It's a theme that was inspired by V and her book, uh, The Apology. Uh, it's a recognition that we're all in a time of reckoning, and we need to look that right in the eye uh, and allow that truth and that witness to work in our souls in a way that transforms our capacity to be more uh, fully uh, human. We'll turn to that uh, in a moment, but first I want to continue my reflections on the uh, war uh, in Ukraine, because we're being confronted in the world today with the most dangerous situation that the world has been in, uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, certainly uh, since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. And this is a situation like in 1962, where the two superpowers, the United States and Russia, are squaring off. And the irresistible force of American expansion and militarism into Eastern Europe is meeting the immovable object of Russian nationalism and nuclear exchange is an increasing probability with each passing day. I've talked a lot about this. We're having a summit on Ukraine at the end of the month. Today, I want to reflect on this absurdity around the balloons because it's all part of the war machine and we need to understand that. I pointed out last week that in his State of the Union address, the one moment when Joe Biden received a standing ovation from every single person in the halls of Congress was when he talked about the war in Ukraine and taking on China around these balloons. And over this past weekend, the U.S. Air Force has shot, uh, I can't remember exactly, three or four unidentified flying objects. Apparently, one of them was a balloon over Alaska, but there was a UFO over Lake Huron, and everybody is in a frenzy around shooting anything that moves. And I just want us to be aware of the escalating militarism in the United States as it's now taking on not just Russia, but China. And it's doing so at the moment when we need to be working with Russia, with China, to solve the real issue, which is runaway climate change. So as we contemplate these issues around reckoning, as we contemplate these issues around racism and colonialism and exploitation of the environment, we need to bear in mind that it is the escalating war machine that both reinforces all these other issues, but is now propelling the, war, the world into a global conflict that may, if it's not handled with proper diplomacy, uh, be the end of us all. And I know that the mass media is fomenting aggressiveness against Russia, against China, and week by week, there's more incidences. And we all need to know 
that this is a propaganda directed by the military industrial complex through the mass media to get us to create enemies in our minds to justify conflict and subordinate real issues like racism in our time. It's a very complex reality with which we're dealing. And it's extraordinarily nuanced because the goal, the end result, if we don't stop this madness, is a nuclear exchange. And that's a final exchange from which there's no recovery. So I wanted to frame our conversation today with uh, uh, three uh, black women within this larger framework of militarism because the two are inseparably interconnected. And we need, as we engage in this reckoning, to look this right in the eye. <clears throat> That's what we do on Humanity Rising. We try to look the things right in the eye. And we know the truth will set us free. We'll have much more to say as the days unfold on these and other matters. But I wanted to just bring this in as uh, the balloon matter continues to, to escalate around us. The final comment I would like to make is it's a matter of fact that the United States has about 100, and I think the latest, latest count is 123 military satellites all over the planet. The Russians have 100 military satellites all over the planet. The Chinese have about 100 military satellites around the planet. And that doesn't count the hundreds and hundreds of other communication satellites everybody has. So to make the, a balloon that wasn't even self-directed, it was just floating way off course into the issue that it has been made into to generate more angst in the global geostrategic world uh, is a, a level of folly. <laughs> if it wasn't so potentially tragic, would be laughable. Let us now pause as we always do at the beginning of all of our sessions on Humanity Rising and in the midst of all this that we have to deal with. Let us just breathe together. In a moment, you'll hear the sound of a bell. Those of you who are new, when you hear the bell, just breathe in slowly for about five and a half seconds. You hear the sound of another bell, and it's just breathe out five and a half seconds. If you do that, you take in five and a half breaths in a minute. You ingest about five and a half liters of air. You calm your soul. You increase your mental acuity. And above all, you create coherence between your heart and your brain and your entire body system. And you begin to resonate with others in a deeper way. So let us breathe 10 breaths, and then we'll begin our program. Thank you, everyone, and welcome.
Thank you, everyone. It's so good to breathe together. It was Plotinus several thousand years ago that said the whole universe breathes as one. So when we breathe together, we're breathing with the universe itself. It's my pleasure now to introduce a good friend and colleague, Joyce Hope Scott, uh, who has been on Humanity Rising uh, a number of times before and has developed uh, for our awareness the history and magnitude of chattel slavery and other areas pertaining to slavery and racism uh, in the United States. Uh, she's a clinical professor of African American and Black diaspora studies at uh, Boston University. And she's the co-founder and the co-director of the International Network of Scholars and Activists for African Reparations. And uh, she's convened uh, this three-day program this week on Black uh, Women's Voices. So Joyce, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us and everything that you've done to support the work that you do uh, in a world in which it is so deeply challenged, but so urgently necessary. And I welcome you to Humanity Rising. Thank you so much, Jim. It's always wonderful to be on your fantastic programs. I am committed to the ideology behind the whole notion of humanity rising. And it's absolutely a pleasure to um, engage in this conversation, which I think is way overdue, but so important and so worthwhile. So I thank you and your, your group for even considering and, and coming forth with this notion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Am I, do I just go forth here? I'm not sure. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Take it. Uh, oh, wow. All right. Wonderful. I, the topic here and a, on apology, atonement and reparations, uh, I think I should introduce my, my speakers um, who are here um, to outstanding sisters and scholars that I want to bring in uh, for you to meet here. Um, if you would come in, um, Akia and uh, Lene, thank you very much. Um, we have with us today, I'll introduce them and then we'll move forward with uh, our program. Uh, their bios are just exhaustive. So I, I'll just try to say, as much as I can uh, about them, and, and you can read further. Uh, Dr. Kia uh, de Barros Gomes, uh, who is a, a senior curator of maritime social histories at Mystic Seaport Museum in Mystic, Connecticut. She's responsible for working on curatorial projects of race, indigenous histories, ethnicity, and diversity in New England's maritime activities. Dr. DeBarros Gomes is director of the Frank C. Munson Institute of American Maritime Studies and visiting professor, visiting scholar at Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, and this, this position is supported by a 4.9 million grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to Brown University's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, part of the foundation's uh, Just Futures Initiative. The grant funds a partnership with Brown with the and Mystic Seaport Museum and Williams College as well, uh, that using maritime history as a basis for studying historical injustices and generating new insights on the relationship between European colonization in North America, racial slavery in New England, and the dispossession of African, of Native American uh, land. Dr. DeBarros Gomes received her BA in anthropology and archaeology 
at Salve Regina University and her MA and PhD in anthropology and archaeology from the University of Connecticut. Welcome, uh, Akia. Thank you so much for agreeing to come. Thank you, Joyce. My next uh, guest this morning is um, Dr. Lene uh, Brayboy, MD. Uh, she's an obstetrician, gynecologist, specialized in reproductive endocrinology. She's a graduate of Florida A&M University and a Fulbright, former Fulbright grantee to the Republic of Mali, West Africa, uh, for her previous work in placenta malaria. Uh, she went to um, Mali. Dr. Brayboy received her medical degree from Temple University School of Medicine, um, residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Bing Binghamton Memorial Hospital, and a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Her primary focus is on the role of multi-drug resistance transporters, MDRSs, and if I mess up anything, you're going to help me with this. <laughs> oh, site um, egg mitochondria, multi-drug resistance transporters, uh, as she explains, are pumps that work to rid cells of tox uh, toxicants and contaminants. Cancer cells and bacteria use these pumps to evade uh, pharmaceutical preparations um, like chemotherapy and antibiotics and so antibiotics. But very little work has been done to understand their role in the context of eggs and how they work to protect uh, oocyte. Specifically, she works on uh, how MDRs modulate mitochondrial physiology and how this interaction between MDRs and mitochondria determines egg quality and quantity. Egg quality and quantity, these are the hallmarks of reproductive aging. She is also, Dr. Brayboy, a recipient of the American Society for Product Reproductive Medicine Research Institute grant and a junior faculty fellowship a recipient of the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. Uh, her early work establishing the role of MDRs uh, was funded by the Reproductive Scientist Department program. Uh, and she, and that was also supported by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. Uh, Dr. Brayboy is uh, associate professor also at the Bedford Research Foundation and formerly the chief medical officer at CLU in Germany. Uh, she is a reproductive scientist at the Charité Hospital in the Department of Neuropediatrics in uh, Germany. Uh, it's currently funding a startup based on her work on oocyte mitochondria. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brayboy, for being here also. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Wonderful, wonderful. I want to start out by reminding us, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to remind our, oh, too much of our audience, that this is Black History Month. That indeed, uh, here in the United States, there is one month that has been allotted per year to actually focus on African-American people or people of African descent, I will say. Uh, and um, for the most part, we hear a lot about Dr. King's speech, um, I Have a Dream, and uh, to the exclusion, which is wonderful, uh, to the exclusion of so much other history and so on, especially where, uh, where Black women are concerned. Uh, this is one of the areas uh, that needs apology, first and foremost. That is one of the first areas of, of apology. Uh, the attempt on the part of um, though in the original enslavers and the colonist settlers of this nation to erase uh, and uh, completely um, bury the history of people who were captured and brought here and who uh, found, laid the foundation economic and so many other areas of this nation. So an apology in the spiritual sense then, it's more than a verbalization of I'm sorry in whatever language uh, one chooses. This, that is not an apology, not the kind that we need. It's a ritual. The apology is a ritual. It must result in a reconciliation. Um, include ritual cleansing or forgiveness of the culprit and the aggressor. It is a, it, it is a unified thing. It's, it, there are two uh, forces involved in this. It has to include a pardon, otherwise saying it's useless. 
the transgression was a visceral act in some way against someone or something. Uh, thus, there has to be an equal correspondence, uh, movement and invocation and of energy or ashe, as we say, in some form uh, that would be the pardon, the forgiveness that completes the act of atonement or apology for us in the United States and around the world where black people have been uh, dispossessed uh, and, dis and, and, and marginalized, uh, plus used and abused and continue to be uh, around the world because of the inherent punishment executable by the earth deity, Onali or Sakpata, as we say also, uh, in this, the community is compelled to purge itself of any misdemeanor, whether committed by an individual or collective. It's not a matter of who owes apology, who owes reparations, who owes restitution, whatever, the entire country, we all owe it to each other and so on. Uh, because the idea is a communal-based, uh, in communal-based cultures, that an individual wrong or transgression affects the entire community. There's always a follow-on after the verbal apology and so on. Um, and so we can talk about that and continue to talk about that. One of the things that is uh, really important uh, to, uh, to mention here, uh, that the title of what we are, I, I thought we would talk about in these sessions, uh, Black Women's Lives, a Mosaic of Stories, Bodies and Knowledges, Vision, Voice, Being, uh, and I ask what apology, what atonement, what repair, what restitution. And um, I, I think that I and my colleagues, like Black women all over the world, find ourselves ever locked in this intersectionality of anti-Black patriarchal power as a global framework uh, for subjugation. Black people, particularly Black women, are tasked with being inconvenienced uh, so that their oppressors is never asked to be uh, inconvenience. Thus, apologizing is at best uncomfortable work because though we are we're met with the truth of ourselves at the very least, um, the reality of how we mistreat somebody else, it's not often that easy to um, assess and so on. I, um, I'll just say a little bit of something about my connection with uh, my, my colleagues. We, we have sort of different areas that we I think we each come from extraordinarily different backgrounds. Uh, I call myself the farmer's daughter, the original farmer's daughter, because my father had a relatively a larger commercial farm. And of course, uh, part of my task in the morning was to milk the cow um, pet by the name. I'll never forget her because we always had our fight. But in essence, uh, this is my grounding and my foundation from people who, as the title of this year's Black uh, History uh, is resistance, Black resistance. I, I come from a family of resistors uh, and uh, pe people who did never let uh, the, uh, the status quo, the ideology, um, define them at all. And uh, my, my colleagues will say a little bit more about themselves, but uh, I think that our, our backgrounds and where we've landed I think we've all wound up in some place uh, with these opportunities to have Fulbrights, to study ab abroad and so on. And this is this is part of what has helped me to widen my, broaden my perspective uh, to, um, as my sister Lene here in Mali, we weren't in West Africa at the same time, but we were both in the Sahel and we have, a, 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 again, experiences to say about this. It's important for me to, I think for this uh, presentation to look at the, the broad issue of Black women, what we call Black women, because we're we're not just a group of people here in the United States with our problem. The issue of Black women, as we'll see when we talk to um, our sisters from all over the place, um, we, we have a sister coming in from Gambia, we have another one coming in from the UK. Uh, and again, I think it's important because when you, when you talk about descendants of African people, women are the most crucial. They were the first ones and I, my my colleague, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, DeBarros Gomes, is going to say more about this colonizing of the black female body. It is the thing. It is the it is the the, the brilliance, quote unquote, that was hit on during slavery to make sure uh, that um, there was control 
uh, of the, the population from the beginning to the end or to try to control it in any event. So uh, the this term then liberty, I would say, uh, which drives the way nations of the Atlantic world has shaped their narratives of nation, minus the African influence, certainly women, how people at different times have imagined this idea and this concept in their own lives. It's especially central to us as black women in particular, uh, we have negotiated their carcerality, the boundaries of their containment, um, of, of that have provided the scope of their liberty. It's always been a boundary or an attempt at boundary of, of enslavement. But as Karen Wolf points out here, uh, she, and she talks about black women uh, who brought liberty to Washington, DC in the 1800s. She uses the terms navigation, improvisation, and self-making to make sense of what happened and continues to happen to black women's lives. Uh, this business of self-making, this responding to uncertainty, the improvisation, all of this self-making is so crucial. I wanna just um, bring up something for a, a minute, just a minute here, and then um, if we can have our... We're here and certainly this occasion um, allows us to re re underscore this, in the middle of a spiritual and social reckoning. We who are speaking today and throughout this session, uh, honoring our ancestors and the other freedom fighters or their energy or our shade, which is propelling these strong vibrations for change that we feel. We pay homage to those on whose shoulders we stand and are called upon to engage the question of apology reciprocity, restitution, and atonement. We forget and we have buried so much. And I wanted to use this image uh, because it is from uh, Harriet Powers, who was a young woman, a young teenager when she made this quilt and uh, uneducated, supposedly um, marginalized and um, dispossessed in every way, but it is an, an amazing piece of work that charts her story, a story of African people, and especially women whom you see prioritized here in each one of the panels uh, in her work. Uh, she, despite all of this, she, uh, this visual work remains for her. This is one of the stories that I want to bring up. The other story, um, and and these are part of the women. These are some of the women that I whose shoulders we stand on. Of course, we thankfully they have been memorialized or attempted to be memorialized in their statues in various places in the United States and in some cases around the world. But the story that I want to tell you is about a little young girl called Claudette Colvin. She um, was a young girl. Um, at um, Booker T. Washington School, I was 16, um, who was sentenced by an all white jury um, and uh, to, who was involved with her, her neighbor, in fact, who remembered her neighbor, Jeremiah Reeves, who was a pupil at her school, who was 16 and sentenced to death by an all white jury for supposedly raping a white woman. Uh, he was in fact executed when he was 22. Um, Claudine talks about how good looking he was, how he always wore clean shirts and sneakers and so on. He was a talented drummer, she said. Um, she remembered how she used to watch him play at the center in the King Hill section. And she said, everyone saw the injustice, uh, the double standards. Uh, and at the time he was on, on Black Road, Black men were saying, do not look at a white woman you see walking down the street. Do not make eye contact with white women. It was, she said, the first time that she'd seen the NAACP in action. At the same time at school, she was encouraged to, doing one of these Black History Month occasions, to um, write and engage critically with the plight of Black citizens. She studied about Jomo Kenyatta and the Mau Mau struggle in Kenya. Uh, she read the literature of Edgar Allan Poe, as well as Black poets like Paul Lawrence Dunbar. 
And one of her assignments, uh, she was asked to write an essay during Negro History Week, it was at the time. How do you feel as an American? And she said, we wasn't considered Americans. We was considered Negroes. We was treated by the ruling class as second class citizens. And this is what she wrote. And then she wrote about the injustice of the Jeremiah Reeves case. On March 2nd, 1955, a very hot day uh, in Alabama, students coming out of the Booker T. Washington High School, like uh, Claudette, boarded a bus, um, a segregated bus, and uh, that went through the, the, the segregated neighborhoods. She was 15 at the time, a very gifted Black student. She wanted to be a civil rights attorney. So she sat by a window near the exit door. She gazed outside until the white driver instructed her to give up her seat for a white passenger standing nearby. She refused and she was dragged off the bus by two white policemen and she screamed, it's my constitutional right. Claudette said, Quote, it felt as if Harriet Tubman's hand was pushing me down on one shoulder and Sojourner Truth's hand was pushing me down on the other. Learning about these two women gave me the courage to remain seated that day. Well, she was handcuffed, put in jail, pleaded not guilty, et cetera. In the newspaper, as you can see there, uh, the Negro girl uh, was put in jail for uh, sitting, uh, um, in, uh, for refusing to move on her seat. After, immediately after her arrest, she was approached by the secretary of the Montgomery NAACP, a seamstress named Rosa Parks. For a brief time, she said the two of them were close friends. She would stay at Rosa Parks's house, serve as a mannequin for her wedding dresses because Mrs. Parks was a seamstress as we know. Rosa was just her name, she said. She was soft-spoken, soft-talking, uh, soft and she elongated her words, Claudette, I knew your mother, Mary Jane. And when I first got the news you were arrested, it, was, it hurt me so bad, Mrs. Um, Park said. They put you in jail instead of a juvenile on, um, center. Nine months later, when Rosa Parks became the face of the bus boycott, Claudette said, adults in the community, had followed my footsteps. I'm happy about that. Later on, she said, they wanted someone, I believe, who would be impressive to white people and be a drawing. You know what I mean? Like the main star. They didn't think a low-income teenager without a degree would contribute. It's like reading an old English novel when you're the peasant and so you're not recognized. I tell that story because there are so many hundreds and thousands of others like that of black women whose stories are hidden and erased uh, from society, from our um, ability to access the information. Uh, so I want to ask my colleagues to weigh in on this, um, on the things that we've said, we, we've got our, we've talked about here, the colonization of the black female body, uh, inspired by the um, Ob Michelle Obama's um, commentary here, power is allowing yourself to be known and heard. Um, we can start with Akia, Dr. DeBarro Scombs. Could you weigh in on this? The the the, the all that I put out there, and not to, not to also overlook uh, Claudette uh, Colvin or at whatever point you want to come in. And again, how do you? in your life uh, come into this story. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you, Joyce. And I, I thank you for telling that story. You know, I didn't know the story of Claudette Colvin until I was maybe in my thirties. Um, and I remember learning, you know, the fact that she was darker skinned, that she was uneducated. She could not be the poster for black liberation. And, and you know what that says about our struggle um, and what we have to accept in order for our voices to be heard. Um, just a really, really powerful history. Um, and I, I will say, you know, before I start, um, I did a presentation last weekend where the, the entire panel 
was black and indigenous women, all of us. And just the energy of, or the power of being the authority, being the storyteller, um, being able to sit with black and indigenous sisters to talk about this history, to talk about the oppression, but also to talk about the joy and our ancestors um, is, is a very powerful thing to me. Um, I, I did not realize in my work until maybe a year ago that in the two decades I've been doing this work that it was a journey of reclaiming, reclaiming all of the things you were talking about, Joyce, when you were speaking. So, um, you know, I, I always thought of myself as going here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I had a focus on Black and Indigenous histories. I worked on Indigenous reservations. I did archaeology projects to validate Black presence, and especially here in New England, to validate that Black people were enslaved here. And that's what built our cities and towns as well. Um, I worked on that and then I flew off with you to West Africa, Joyce, and then I flew off to Central America and then I did work in the Caribbean and a Rastafarian community, all of these things that seemed very disconnected. But when you start listening, especially when you start listening to the woman, women, you start to realize the, the impact of this system of colonialism on black women's bodies. And in my position now, in the storytelling that I'm doing, I'm seeing how all of those things are so related. Um, it's the same story. And it is a story of, you know, right now being in this place where we are reclaiming things that were supposed to be erased, things that were supposed to be broken, reclaiming our bodies, reclaiming our ancestors, um, reclaiming, you know, our skin color and what it means and the history behind our different shades and what that means. Um, reclaiming the joy that's been ever present in our communities, despite the oppressions and despite the violence. It's all part of this grand narrative and I am still grappling with what is that grand narrative and, and how do we bring that to life in a way that is sensitive and honors the divine feminine and honors our bodies and honors the struggles of our ancestors. Um, and I will, um, you know, before I know this is supposed to be a conversation, not a lecture. So <laughs> before I um, hand it over to Lene, I will just say, um, you know, you said in, in my intro uh, choice, my background is in anthropology and archaeology. And um, again, I always saw the things that were of interest to me as very disconnected started coming together when we traveled to West Africa. I started wrapping my head around what it all meant. But I also, you know, I, I have a, a dear friend who uh, was a tribal elder who passed away last year. And um, the first time I met him was about 20, 25 years ago. We happened to bump into each other on our way out a door. <laughs> we were at a conference together and we sat down and it was about 2 p.m. And I did not realize until I saw the moon overhead that we had been sitting and talking for six hours. Um, he was doing most of the talking, but something that I always carry um, with this work that he said to me is, um, and he said it very sort of nonchalantly, but it resonated so deeply. Um, he said, you know, Akia, the creator gave every tribe one piece of the puzzle, but he only gave every tribe one piece of the puzzle. And so until we start having dialogue and talking, we're never going to get it right until every tribe is in communication about the history, about the legacy, about our ancestry, about our stories, about our indigeneity. We are not going to understand the universe. We're just not. And so that is something I think about when I think about this history and atonement and apology. What is my place in this system? And what do I need to atone for before I should expect apology and atonement? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you've said so much. That's, and you brought in the um, the indigenous the connection up to um, to some degree. And we we talked about this last summer uh, in our program at the at the museum, as you know. And um, I'm I'm thankful to you for helping me to understand that because literally in my own family background, there's that connection which I don't pay a lot of attention to as much attention as possible. I want to ask. Um, Lene, uh, Dr. Brayboy to 
please uh, go ahead and weigh in on this or uh, come in at whatever point you've got a whole nother thread to add to this and having worked not on as far away with women as Mali and, and, and Germany and uh, New England and yeah, just go. Yeah, well, thank you again for the invitation. I think um, for me, actually similar to um, Akia is just that I, when I went to Mali, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I knew that I was interested in research. I knew that I was interested in science. And when I went to Mali, I found my purpose. Um, I found my purpose because I was surrounded by Black women who were teaching me about what Black women had to be subjugated to. And one of the things in Mali that struck me was that women who could not bear a child, could not conceive, could be isolated from their communities. They could be divorced. They could be uh, treated poorly by their mother-in-law or their in-laws in general. And so it was then and there that I was interested in fertility. And I came back uh, after my Fulbright and started medical school and went directly from Bamako, Mali to uh, Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, it was a very different experience that I had. I, we were in North Philadelphia, which is mostly a black community. And I started to realize the difference in how patients who were affluent and white were treated versus patients who were black and who lived in the, in the greater North Philadelphia area. And this was never talked about during my medical education. We never talked about the, um, the history of medical oppression. Um, and we didn't talk about racism in medicine. These are all things that became new um, in the last several years uh, since Black Lives Matter has become front and center and the murder of George Floyd. And one of the things that I think struck me early on was that I was taking care of someone who was very young, so, so not, not much older than uh, Claudette uh, when she sat down on the bus, uh, who was having a baby. And the way she was treated, because she was young, uh, not educated, uh, from a socioeconomic background that was not high, um, versus how someone who would be white and married and perhaps very well to do was treated. That was my entryway into my career. Um, and I remember I wrote a very long letter to the Dean of the medical school. Um, and it was, um, I was, I was sort of shoot away. Like, uh, you know, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about, but it was then that I realized that there was a very, very big difference. And I was usually the only black woman in a group of people in any scenario in medical school and residency and fellowship and beyond. And I found community uh, with uh, another physician who was an intern uh, who was Black, and she was uh, like a mentor to me. She still is my friend to this day. And, you know, it, it would just happen that I would be in the room without her when something racist would be said or something really just disgusting would happen. And I realized early on that as a black woman, especially in a field where I was very isolated, I needed to form community connections always uh, so that I could survive. Because, you know, there was really very much, I think medicine's very much like the military where you can't really speak out of turn. You are a subordinate and there's very much a hierarchy. And, you know, having the ability to discuss it with someone like me, I think was an offloading of the burden um, and, and having that ability to do that, I think, allowed me to, to keep going. Um, at the time, I was a single mom. Um, I had a baby actually the first year of med school. And many people thought that I would drop out, um, that I wouldn't make it. Um, and when I went to residency, I remember crying the day that I matched in residency. So all medical students, we usually get together and find out at the same time where we're going to residency. And I cried because a black woman had just sued the hospital for racial um, discrimination. And it was well known in that area. And, um, and so when you match, you have to go there. It's a computer system puts it together. 
um, and you don't really have an option. And when I when I started residency, I remember that there was a newly appointed lawyer who was there to sort of monitor the situation and also improve diversity and inclusion at the hospital. And she gave me my she gave me her card and said, if you ever have any issue, let me know. And that was so important because it gave me the ability to stand up for myself and be present and be seen in a place that wasn't necessarily used to having black women in that position. And I think, you know, for me in terms of what is what is the apology that needs to be said to black women is we shouldn't have to, to apologize for being there. Sometimes even our presence in a place where we're not typically present is offensive. Offensive because it's a reminder that actually we are educated, actually we are smart, actually we are capable. And sometimes that without even knowing can bring you into a point of um, conflict with you know your work environment, your home environment. And so I think having made community connections along the way, I had a very wonderful group of black women who were nursing staff there at that hospital. Then when I went to fellowship, you know, I didn't have those connections and it was much, much harder. And I left uh, the United States right um, during the Trump era, the first Trump era, hopefully the last Trump era, um, and Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's murder. And I left and I went to Germany. And the, one of the reasons I came to Germany is because I had and continue to have a community of Black women that I can connect with, who understand not only my plight as a Black woman in the U.S., but also as you know an expat uh, or migrant here in Europe. And I think that has been so valuable to me because it's it's healing. When I'm around other Black women, I can heal from the constant onslaught that I have felt as a Black woman. And I think in no other way, in no other community, can I really do that? And that exchange has, I think, kept me alive, really, um, because, uh, you know, you started out, Dr. Joyce, talking about where you came from. Where I came from is, you know, the Deep South. I came from um, Florida, although it's not considered by all the, to be the Deep South. You know, my, my parents and my grandparents decided not to do the Northern migration. They stayed in the South. They were in Black communities that had you know, doctors and nurses, and it was not unusual um, for these people to be held in high esteem in their community. My grandmother was a nurse. Um, she was a, a beacon of education, information, health literacy for our community. And, you know, she had a community of Black female friends that she was constantly in fellowship with. And this is, this is what I think we should always think about when it comes to atonement apologies, reparations, the things that slavery, the things that discrimination have done to us is separate us from our community. And now it's about getting back to those, to those very important uh, connections. Thank you so much. That's just absolutely wonderful. Um, I appreciate it so much, Lene. You, you, you've just really, um, filled in so many blanks and, and just, just illuminated uh, so many um, points of, of intersection that we, we just don't think about. You know, what does it mean to a, a woman like yourself uh, to have done what you've done? Against the odds, it's not supposed to happen. Um, I, I was thinking as you spoke, and I'd like to ask uh, Kia to weigh in on this, um, going back and thinking back again to what uh, Claudette said about feeling the hands of those women on her shoulder uh, this this is a young girl, remember, who is was not without mother. Mrs. Parks said she knew, told her she knew her mother. She didn't. She really wasn't mothered, and that that is a story of so many millions of African Americans uh, in this country. The story, and I teach my classes. I say, listen, the story of African Americans in this in this country, which is erased and uh, not uh, um, made uh, not illuminated, is the the role of orphans in the building of this nation because of the separation, the arbitrary and capricious separation of, of children 
from uh, their parents and from their mothers, the inability to mother uh, and those kinds of things. Um, going into the arenas where you've been, I'm, I'm a first generation um, PhD, college graduate, et cetera, et cetera, from my family, a, a long line of both paternal and maternal, as I said, resistors and proud people. And I'm, I'm happy to say I stand on their shoulders even going back. What is it that, that uh, today I need to apologize to them? I, I, if, if I've misstepped in some kind of way, I feel a great obligation uh, that we all need to apologize to them. Listen, this is the decade of African descended people. The United Nations has said that this decade, starting in 2015, I think, up through 2024, uh, is the decade of African descended people. And I don't know a single country who was implicated in the slave trade, the, the, the Atlantic trafficking, who has made much of this, who has done anything about it. And the United States had, there's been nothing at the national level or whatever. It's as though it didn't happen, as though it's not even there. You know, what does that say? Are we are we still, is, is the, the move, the, the this distance from the auction block, how far is it? to today when there can still be this kind of, 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 of dis, um, disassociation or whatever, or uh, lack of, of, of even acknowledgement. We had the UN Decade of Women, wonderful, wonderful. We had a lot of great, great policies that came out. Uh, and we've, we've had the, the, the conference on ingenuity, the right of people to use and be taught in their own mother tongues, et cetera, et cetera. What will come out uh, from this uh, business of the United Nations who already declared that the trafficking, Atlantic trafficking and colonization is a crime against humanity. How does your research as, as an archeologist and your anthropologist and so on and so forth illuminate uh, pieces of that story or other stories that can, can advance uh, or that has helped you to, to build your, your strength, your resilience and your determination to stay in your field? Well, in, in response to that, I will say something that Dr. Brayboy actually brought to mind. And Joyce, you and I have had this conversation before. Um, we are all in disciplines and fields where we were meant to be the other. We were meant to be the subject. We were meant, studies of us were meant to solidify empire, right? And justify colonialism. And so being not only black, but women in these disciplines, having to, having to move ourselves from other and subject to authority is very difficult. And I will tell you, you know, in research that I've done on the colonization of black women's bodies, something very interesting, you know, happens. I won't say it happens all the time, but even once is too much, right? I, I'm talking about the history of colonization of black women's bodies and women in the diaspora and asserting that, you know, black women's bodies were utilized to, and, and this is a, a pattern we still see today, right? Black women's bodies during colonialism, women of color, their bodies during colonialism were utilized for the pleasure of colonizers because they couldn't bring women with them when they were, you know, exploring exploring territories that they were to colonize. And so in that moment, black women became se sexual objects for European men. And you see the traces of that throughout history, right? You see it in military brothels, right? That were often run by white women, that this was seen as the perfect outlet for white soldiers so that they wouldn't rape so that they wouldn't engage in same-sex activities, right? Black women's bodies being used to shore up their masculinity. And so I often think about the whole history of our discipline, right? My discipline, our disciplines, in othering us. And while we are trying to do this work of resistance and acknowledgement, we are doing it within colonial disciplines, right? I work in a museum, a colonial institution. And so asserting that voice and acknowledging that within our disciplines also puts us in a certain position professionally, right? And so trying to honor our ancestors, especially the women who are culture keepers and who taught us and who taught us how to be proud, 
and who were able to do that. Because as you said, Joyce, quite frankly, many black women were not. And I think about the apologies I owe to my grandmother, who was also a nurse, um, who would sit and try to tell me family history when I was younger, but being a 12 year old, I just wanted to go out and play. But she was actually telling me, she was a Cape Verdean immigrant, and she was telling me through these fun stories, all of the places our family was from and indigenous ancestry, black ancestry, and Cape Verdean ancestry and European ancestry. And so I think part of why I am in this field is to honor her as a black woman storyteller, as someone who tried to, you know, with her at first, with her limited education, tried to keep these histories alive. Um, standing on her shoulders, standing on the shoulders of her great grandmother who went out to North Dakota and was this amazing businesswoman. I don't want to say what business she was in, but was an amazing businesswoman, very wealthy, um, blurred the color line, and, and just all of these amazing individuals that brought us to where we are. And I will say at the end of presentations now, uh, even the one I gave last weekend, on the thank you slide or the thank you page or, or whatever, um, at the end, I, I always thank my ancestors. Because what I say to the, to the audience is, whether or not you believe your ancestors are present in your daily lives and impact your daily lives, we literally wouldn't be here without their struggle, without their perseverance, without their resistance. Um, and so, you know, not only to stand on their shoulders and apologize for missteps, um, because really this work, I don't want to speak for the two of you, but for me, this work has never been about promotion, tenure, wealth. It is, it is really about honoring the story and the voices of the women I come from who, in order to literally maintain their lives, had to be silent or when they spoke up or silenced. This work for me is a way of uncovering their stories the way they would have wanted their stories to be told in the context of the erasure of our slave history, the nostalgia around our slave history, right? We all, well, all of us in the Northeast know that we're always hearing the, the stories of the successful beloved slave who became a successful business owner or who was so beloved by the family that enslaved them that they decided to stay once they were freed. Um, really challenging that narrative and giving voice to the lived experiences of Black women who were, were enslaved, were in that position, who could not give their children their husband's last names, because not only could they not live with their husbands, because they belonged to their enslaver, their children belonged to their enslaver. So you knew from the moment they were born that they were never yours, they were someone else's property. Giving voice to women like that is the reason I do what I do. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that, you know, absolutely. I, I think that we've all had that recurring motif about the grandmother or whatever. And uh, again, I, I think about uh, my Gullah Geechee um, speaking grandmother and so on, uh, and um, from the islands of South Carolina, et cetera. And um, so African carrying things on her head, you know, and I'm saying, oh my God, you know, Nana, she's a little odd, whatever, because of course, being the middle class aspirant, you you have to, of course, speak the, the king's or the queen's English. And Nana spoke uh, a little bit funny, but she she is the one whose voice, as she said to me, she's, you get out there among them, honey, they are not any better than you. You can do whatever they can do and you can do it better. And I, that rings an illiterate woman who had children at 13. Okay, uh, these, we need to apologize to them. Those are the ones I'd say, we've all, all agreed. Before talking about the, the larger apology that's needed for African descended people who were trafficked to take stolen and taken away from their, their very being before, you know, before I wanna talk about that, I wanna talk about what I, what I owe, who, to whom I need to, to, to make apology and to ask for forgiveness and to ask for, uh, to, for pardon uh, and, and, and make proper restitution, whatever it is I need to make to those people who took the wagon train, who, who um, women who homesteaded land, women who had 
hundreds of acres of land that I could never know how they got it. I, I don't even want to know how they got it, but they had it uh, that they could pass down to me and my generation and so on. Um, so, and in terms of uh, the uh, the whole business of today, when we look at women like us, people would say, and I've heard, I've had people say to me, well, you know, you are an exception, not, not even, uh, you're an exception. You don't know what it's like to grow up this way or that way. You don't know what it is to, to come up in a flat, you know, or whatever and so on. And then that's true. I don't know what that is. Uh, that's not my experience, but I've had an experience and I, and I know, and I do know that um, uh, about that as well. So we, you know, we, as these women that you've all pointed out here, women black women who um who let's say are our ancestors those who were 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 force fed or those who were at the bottom of the the ships or whatever that they went through and our we all have these stories in our own family you know how how does one how how does anybody apologize how do you apologize to the african woman for taking everything from her taking her children, taking her milk, taking her time, taking and continuing to take it, to do a, the experimentation, uh, the, the deaths, and you know this uh, very much, Lene, uh, of women, young women who are giving birth today. The statistics are startling. Why are, are young Black women dying in childbirth? Why are their children dying and so on? You know, how do we, how do we even uh, attempt to address that? Yet you have this resiliency, you have the determination, you have the resistance. People in the reparations movement and every every young women in my classes and, and that you deal with and, and so on and so forth. You know, what is it, what does it mean? What would that even begin to look like in terms of how do we begin uh, to think about healing as a nation uh, and, and doing right uh, like Celie said, until you do right by me, mister, <laughs> you will never be free and you will never be successful until you do right by, do right by yeah. Black women in order to save the soul of a nation. How do we do that? I don't, I think that I can't put it into words. There's no one step. There's no program. There's no DEI seminar that people can go to and say, ah, I've done my job. I've done my part. I think though every single person needs to recognize that they're here because of a black woman, end of story. I think that's, that's not said enough that obviously we created all human beings, all humankind. And one of the reasons that I study oocyte mitochondria is because from your mother, your mother gives an oocyte, your, your father, your biological father gives a sperm cell. And in that oocyte, in that egg, is what's called mitochondria. Those all come from your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother and your great-great-grandmother. And that is what keeps the embryo alive. That's what sustains the embryo before it can actually implant and do something called placentation and make a placenta. And so you are literally here because of the woman before and the woman before and the woman before that. And if you go back to the original woman, then that's a black woman in Africa. And so first of all, science seemingly has forgotten that um, because we don't ever talk about that when it comes to reproduction. We don't ever talk about how we are from this one woman. And one of the ways that we could even begin to make amends for the, the forced separation of women from their children is to try to help restore some information. And that's possible. It's not just a kit that you get through 23andMe and you can find your family members. There should be an actual ability to trace where you come from that you don't have to pay for and that you can have a home going. I mean, this is similar to what people do in Israel where they are able to go to Israel, they're able to learn to speak Hebrew, they're able to be Israeli citizens. This is the exact same thing that we need for Black women. This is, I think, 
what is missing for a lot of women in the diaspora and people in diaspora. I think even in my own family, I need to apologize, speaking of the, the question before this one, to my mother's biological mother. Um, her choices were limited. She decided to give my mother up for adoption. It was the best choice for her. But for that, we are forever separated from that family. We're forever in the dark about her. And yet she was able to outlive and survive all of my grandparents, despite the fact that she had a lot of children that were unintended, despite the fact that she didn't have resources, despite the fact that probably her diet and lifestyle wasn't the best. She, she survived. And I think that part of what we need to do is first of all, recognize however small or great each Black woman's contribution has been, we are here because of Black women. And when we think about this pandemic that has killed so many people, and you know, of course we have also the backdrop of this war in Ukraine and other wars that have been going on constantly around the world, what, you know, one person that I think of who was instrumental in keeping us safe and healthy with the development of vaccines is a Black woman, a Black immunologist who helped create the science that went into the vaccines. And, you know, we've heard about her, but very peripherally. We've heard about many more um, dominating personalities. Um, this is, these are the people that need to have the light shown upon them because oftentimes um, we are in the backdrop. We're in, we're, we're behind the scenes and we're never celebrated. And, and why, it's not that people need to be celebrated for pride or recognition. We need to be there so that we can show other black women and girls um, and black people that we are here, that we, we do this work. We put in this work every single day. And therefore, when you see people, you can recognize their contribution and give them the, the credit that is due to them. And when I, often when I go to meetings and I give speeches and talks about my science and I look around and I'm the only one, people will say, oh, it's a pipeline issue. It's not a pipeline issue. When you look at the number of undergraduates who actually are minorities, who get degrees in uh, the biological sciences, um, it's actually about almost 25%. And this is old data from the National Academy of Science. Um, and you, you, know, you look and then you look at how many people go and get a terminal degree and it, it drops to 9%. And if you look at that, of those people, very few of those people are black women. And why is it? Well, it's the constant um, messaging that, well, this is really not for you. Um, in my own life, I wanted to actually have an MD PhD. And I remember people, especially white men telling me it's really hard. Oh, you could never do that. You know, translational science, it's just something that's not attainable for, you know, somebody like you. Not ever saying because I'm black, not ever saying because I'm woman, but the innuendo is there. And, you know, and now years later, I wish I could have talked to myself at 21 or at 18 and said to myself, you actually will do it. You will survive. You'll continue to get the grants. So continue to write the papers um, and you'll figure it out despite people trying to maybe throw you off your course. And so I think the way we start, getting back to the question, the way we start is just first recognizing we are all here because of a black woman, um, from the first woman to the woman that keeps us alive every day um, in, in various fields, not just medicine. When you look at the medical staff in this country, in the United States, it's really made up of black women. When you think about the people who support the infrastructure of our society, it's black women, teachers, uh, you know, nursing, nursing. When you think about all of the things, preschool teachers, you know, daycare, all of the things that we can't do without, all of those things are really, really supported by black women, but don't get the credit. And when you think about black women as a whole in the United States, and even more so in Germany, we're the most educated group. We are the most progressive group. We have degrees and everything that goes with it, but we're, we're the lowest paid group. So that goes to what do we what do we appreciate? We appreciate 
people by paying them, by giving them credit, by showing them our regard. And that doesn't happen for Black women. I think now having immigrated to Germany, it's lovely to see Black women in places of of power here, Black women who own businesses here, Black women who support other Black women um, in, in Berlin specifically. And when I tell people this, they're kind of shocked. We do have these networks in the United States, but it's much more accessible here just because of the, the proximity um, in, my, in my experience anyhow. But the point is, is that the reason we even have this ability is because one of the reasons is Audrey Lord was here at Berlin. She made community. She talked about black women talking to each other and seeing each other and forming networks. And again, going back to community. And that has really persisted to her credit and to the people that followed in her footsteps. And I think every single one of us can help formulate that in some way. In a, in a, I, and not in a way that's false, like, oh, I know that you're black, so you should meet this black person, but in a way that helps facilitate community because you recognize that the oppression the, the stripping of, of community, the stripping of, of children from their mothers has happened. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is that the medical community has been actively involved in this. Um, and one book that I, that I read recently after attending a conference for nurse midwives as part of my former role, it was a book called Skimmed. And it's about the first black quadruplets who survived. And when you read that book, you just, you become enraged because here were four beautiful babies that were born to a woman in the South who was illiterate and um, deaf and mute. And she wasn't seen to be fit to be a mother. And yet these children, these beautiful babies were taken away from their family. And an OBGYN who was in the same organization that I'm in was able to capitalize on their image just so that he could form relationships with the formula industry um, and and actually improve the sales in the black community of formula, which it worked. I was a formula fed baby um, and all the reasons that you shouldn't, if you can't, if you you can hopefully do breastfeeding, that's the best, but if you have to do formula, there are better formulations now, but formula is mostly sugar. And one of the, biggest health ailments that we have in the black community continues to be pre-diabetes and diabetes, which starts at birth, if not before birth, because of all of the experiences, something called allostatic load, which is the molecular load of, of constant racism. But on top of that, the, you know, the medical system, unfortunately, has also been an immense oppressor of black women. And so you know, if you read this book, Skimmed, essentially these girls were not only taken from their family, they were used as poster children. They were paraded around different black communities, um, but they all died. They all died early of breast cancer. And the physician who capitalized, who used their image, uh, he did experimentation on them, you know? And we, we don't even begin to understand everything that has been done to black women within this system, which also breeds the distrust, the, tr- the distrust that we saw during the pandemic with getting you know, vaccinated. In my own family, there were people who wouldn't get vaccinated because they, despite me being a physician, they, they, they understand the history and they understand what the victimization that has happened before um, and therefore wouldn't access vaccines. And so, If you can't be open, if you can't apologize, if you can't take steps, then this this creates more of the problem that we currently face. Lene, can I just mention something? My mind was going. Oh, you go right ahead (laughs) because I'm getting ready to call on you. (laughs) (laughs) Just a few connections I'm making to things that you said, you know, and that Joyce said about mothers and Black women. And then you talked about the vaccine and black women scientists not getting credit, my mind immediately went to, you know, enslaved women here during the colonial era right. who taught colonists how to inoculate yes. their children. Yes. But of course, black women 
weren't seen as medical professionals, even though they had this vast knowledge of herbs, they were midwives, they took care of the babies, they raised the babies to adulthood. Um, The fact that that was seen as silly and witchcraft, that's and right. it is now we how killed. we protect, protect ourselves from epidemic. That was Black women, enslaved Black women, who taught colonists that science of inoculation. Um, right. So even from the beginning, right, not yeah. given credit. In Boston, in the yes. in Boston, <laughs> right? So from the beginning, and, and it goes on, and it goes on. And, and if you think about all of the things that we have in modern gynecology, all of those things were formed on the black body. You know, if we think about obstetric racism, there's lots of scholars. I'm not a scholar on obstetric racism, but from the lectures that I've heard, you know, we, we, we do many things to undermine the, the black female body, especially when it's the most vulnerable. Um, and that's during pregnancy. Would you say? I've been subject to it. I was, you know, and this is very personal, but I I always feel the need to share it in this context in particular. Um, I want to say it was about 15 or 16. I was on the table in a gynecologist's office and his words to me were that I was very healthy. I I could have my nine or 10 babies. And that rings in my ear because it just, he didn't think twice about saying that to a 16 year old black girl. You're perfectly healthy. You can go have your nine or 10 babies. Never said I wanted babies. Mm-hmm. Did He didn't know anything about me as a person, right. but that was the assumption. The reproductive justice model somehow was skipped in my medical training. I didn't re- learn those two words together until probably three years ago, really. I didn't know about the, the founders of the movement and how you as a black woman have choice and agency over your body. And, and I think what is missing in that conversation is, is the word choice, right? I mean, the Roe v. Wade has told us that you don't really have a choice in the United States, that someone else can make that decision for you because apparently we're incapable of choosing what we want to do with our body. And conversely, if you wanna have eight or nine, 10 kids, that's your choice. But if you don't wanna have kids, that's also your choice. And when you look at, what funds reproductive care in the United States. You know, Medicaid funds a lot of it, but they don't fund infertility treatments. And it's really interesting that it was for the benefit of the colonial past to try to maximize reproduction for women when it was convenient for them, but now try to minimize reproduction in, in of black women's bodies. And so, you know, you can't get infertility care. And so why can you get contraception for the moment, anyhow, before the Supreme Court repeals that, you can get contraception for now, but you can't, if you want to have children, you can't do that through state monies, even though you are taxed equally, even though you pay taxes just like everybody else. Um, And even on some private plans, you know, in the state of Massachusetts, for instance, it has to be covered, but you can just go, you know, maybe up to New Hampshire or over a little bit more, and you may not get any fertility care coverage. And so, it's really a problem. You're right. It's really an issue that we can be so excluded, yet so um, needed for the infrastructure of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of my incredibly informed, uh, amazing sisters and scholars and all of the other things I want to say about you. I, I'm not going to forget uh, that I do want Jim to weigh in on this conversation uh, with questions and so on. I'm just going to uh, thank you so very much and um, just say ashe, ashe, ashe to both of you. And um, just to wrap up by reminding everybody that yes, you've seen some extraordinarily um, uh, talented and uh, professional black women here this morning, uh, well today, but racism in the United States and around the world, or I should say anti-black racism is pervasive. It's a major contributor to disparities in everything. Health, we talked a lot about, rightly so, education, economics, the legal justice system, many other areas, every other area of of American life, uh, and it impacts the lives and and the uh, potential of African descended women. women. This historical narrative about racial inferiority 
has exacerbated and the discriminatory practices and the, the images that are shown from Hollywood and every other image is either the angry black woman or the semi nude woman or whatever. And we never see people like us, you know, no one's going to bother to film us or whatever. Uh, so we're not in legalized slavery anymore, but the impact of, of, of that institution impact of being able to traffic people across the world to, to uh, colonize and consume their bodies at will, et cetera. This is a part of our narrative that we unfortunately continue to consume every day. We And this is how we need to work together to figure out we, how do we, how do we heal? How do we open that wound? As my colleague said, it's a womb in our stomach. Scar tissue has grown over it. We think we're okay. We keep putting bandages on it. But if we don't open it up, get the infection out, as my sister Lene can tell us, we are we we it's going to uh, it'll drag, bring us down, uh, and and this is what we uh, a part of what we certainly need to do. I want to thank you so much. I praise to our ancestors and so on. And I'm going to let uh, Jim please uh, ask questions or take us to task as you wish. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. This has been so powerful uh, on the part of all three of you. I'm I'm deeply moved uh, and ashamed oh. as a white man for uh, everything that uh, we've caused uh, you to suffer. Um, you know, and I wanted to just start with you, Lene, um, in terms of since you're, you know, an American, having, as I understand it, immigrated now to Europe and Germany, how have you experienced racism uh, in America and Europe? Have, is it uh, basically the same? Do you feel it's more intense in the United States and it's much less in uh, Germany? Because you're dealing with Germany, you know, with a country that has historically been extraordinarily racist, uh, particularly against the Jews. So, and uh, uh, Kia and Joyce, also, you've traveled so much internationally. I'd just love to hear your reflections on the uh, the 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 comparison of the racism against Black women in America and how you've experienced it elsewhere. Yeah, for me, being in Berlin, I am able to actually uh, exercise my American privilege way more than I ever have in my entire life. Here, I am Black, but as soon as they know I'm American, things change. Absolutely, the feeling changes. Um, Berlin is a special place because during uh, the war when Berlin was cut off from food reserves, the people were fed by American soldiers. And so there's, um, there's a great love mm. for America here mm. in Berlin. And I think what's the difference is that there's there's no lack of racism here. There's definitely racism here. But I think the difference is that when I show up, people kind of already, oh, you're American? It's not that Germans are enthusiastic, but if you could imagine German level enthusiasm, they become more enthusiastic because I'm American. And then I was just talking to a colleague of mine who's a Jamaican, African-American, and, you know, it's like we are the source of culture. We are the source of knowledge here. And and even in, you know, Nazi Germany during the war, they put Nefertiti, which they who they stole, the bust of Nefertiti, um, way deep, deep, deep in the deepest crypt in the museum. So she didn't get destroyed. And so I always find it ironic, ironic that. I live in this country that I love. I love Germany, I have to say, for many reasons. Um, but there's this, there's this reckoning, and then there's, there's, not, there's this not reckoning. So you can't walk around. I think um, for the Atlantic, I think his name's Clint Smith, he wrote a, an article about the, 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 oh my God, my German is terrible right now, the Stuppelsteiner. But the, these, these, you know, it was meant to be an art um, installment, basically giving homage and, and space to people who were taken and killed because of the Nazis in Germany. You can't walk here without knowing that something bad happened. You have to be deaf, dumb, and blind. But in the U.S., we don't have that. You can walk around. You can, if you listen to people like mm. DeSantis in Florida, my home state, you can Pretend nothing happened. Nothing happened. This critical race theory. What is this? Oh, we didn't. You know, we didn't do this. 
but it's, that's not the case here in Germany. There's there, there has been a reckoning. Now there is, I would say, this very conservative element that is here. Um, and I remember when I found out that my next door neighbor upstairs and downstairs uh, are part of this conservative element. And someone said, well, what, are you going to move? Aren't you afraid? And I said, no, I'm not afraid. If in any country, I know that this person can't step over the line, it's definitely here. And every day they have to see me. We walk through the hallway together. We have to greet each other. And when you come down to it, their politics are not very different than some parties, the Republican Party, in the United States. And so the difference is I can see his face on a poster here and know who he is versus in the United States, I don't know who they are. I don't know who calls the police when they think that I'm breaking into my own house in Rhode Island. I don't know who's uh, calling the police, for instance, on the catering staff who was setting up for a party of mine um, or harassing them. You know, this is the difference. Um, and I think also two people haven't been exposed um, to the same type of racism as we have in the US. It's a very, um, New England especially, I would say from the deep South, I used to think that people were, you know, if you wear your KKK robe, I can see you coming from a mile. I don't like you, you don't like me, we stay apart. But in, in the Northeast, I felt like, especially New England, it was very, oh, <laughs> nice to see you, but it was very uh, covert. Um, and, and I think here it's, you know, the, the racism that I've encountered is more like, oh, I thought all black people could dance. Cause you know, it's just, they, they, they just take it for granted because they've never encountered anyone closely who is a, a, a black person. And so I think Berlin is a special place because it's a, it's everybody is here literally. Um, but when you go outside of Berlin, especially um, it's a different story. So just like New York is not the U S Berlin is not Germany, but my experience here has been more of um, it's, I can see, I can, I can read the landscape in the U.S. because I grew up there, but here I can read the landscape because it is, to me at least, very apparent um, the the places that would be concerning and not concerning because I've been here during an election. I've seen people's faces. I've heard political speeches. Um, the U.S. to me is it could be my neighbor um, who would be on papers. I'm not a racist, but they definitely use every opportunity to use either microaggressions or macroaggressions. So that's the difference for me. Hmm. Thank you. That was very insightful. Thank you so much. Akia, do you have anything you'd like to add, Joyce? Go ahead, Akia, and I'll <laughs> defer to you right now and I'll come back. Well, I was gonna say, you know, this feels like a conversation that we could sit and have all day. <laughs> I'm listening to Dr. Brayboy and thinking about, you know, you said you live in Rhode Island. I'm from Newport, grew up in Newport, where that same reality is there. Largest slave port in the United States. No acknowledgement of it. So much so that, you know, when, when I was in graduate school, um, I worked on uh, an indigenous reservation. And um, that tribal nation taught me how to empower yourself by telling your own history, right? And the importance of that. So halfway through writing my dissertation, which was just, you know, taking my master's that I did on the reservation and, and, and updating it, um, I stopped that work and said, I'm gonna study colonial black communities in Newport. And, and just so you have a context of this, Again, largest slave port in the United States, rivaled Southern slave ports, right? Um, but there was nothing up until very recently, nothing on the landscape that even hinted at black history, black presence, black contributions, black freedom, because there were free black property owners and communities during the era of slavery. No one was telling that story to the extent that, you know, I polled, um, elementary school teachers, and I just gave them a map and said, could you put, you know, on, on this map, just an X wherever there's black history and no one could put a single X on the map. 20 years later, we're in a place where there is a port marker 
memorial to the enslaved that were brought to Newport that that's, you know, in the works. Um, there are several organizations that are digging into black history in Newport from the beginning, but there are those voices that are saying, why do we need to do this? <laughs> right. They, they're invested in the Gilded Age history of Newport, not the history of slavery, not the knowledge that every name of every street in that city is the name of a slave owner. Right. That the names of our big buildings and the people that we honor were enslavers. The biggest Unitarian church in Newport belongs to you know, this, and I was talking about nostalgia earlier, which is the way we erase slavery. Um, there's a woman that, that was enslaved by the name of Duchess Comino in Newport. And all you ever hear about Duchess Comino is how much the Channing family loved her. Um, so much so that the, the son who was the founder of the Unitarian Church in Newport um, wrote her epitaph. He loved her, she raised him, um, she stayed with the family. Um, well after her enslavement ended, it was, it's this beautiful story. She was the pastry, pastry queen of Rhode Island and that's how she's remembered. But we don't tell the story that she was brought to Newport in chains when she was 14, that she had to sleep in a cold attic on a pallet on the floor. She got married, she was allowed to get married wasn't allowed to live with her husband. She had to continue to live with her enslavers and keep their last name. Had to sleep on a pallet in the, on the floor of their children's bedroom, not her children. Had to put their children before her own children so that they wouldn't be sold away from her. And that really her staying with the family was probably a way for her to not die in poverty, right? Because it was a household for her and her children. And so, that nostalgia is the story that we love to tell in New England about the history of slavery, rather than doing that deep dive into the pain that was caused and the legacy of that history on the landscape today. Because I can assure you that in the late 18th century, where we see these enclaves of black communities, because if you owned property, you had to live on the margins of town, right? Because people didn't wanna see black property owners. They didn't wanna hear black property owners. If you look at a map of Newport now, where are the predominantly Black, Latinx, and low-income neighborhoods? They've moved geographically, but they are still on the margins of town. And that's a legacy of that history that goes all the way back to the mid-17th century. But we don't talk about that. And that in and of itself, to me, is racism, right? That, that is at the heart of, of New England racism, that non-acknowledgement of how New England was built and the names on buildings and street corners and just mm. rejecting anything on the landscape that points to history or historical black presence. Unless it's Frederick Douglass, then we love it. <laughs> wow. You know, and this speaks to the importance of the critical race theory and why it explains why it's so fiercely opposed because it means getting to the other side of the story. And if you can get to the other side of the story, all kinds of things will naturally change. But if you can prevent it, everything can basically stay the same. Yeah. I think those are really, as I view it, the battle line of our time around critical race theory. But you, you all may have a, a, a different point of view. Yeah, and it's complicated, too, because when I think about my own experience, which is a bit different from either of my sisters here, um, like I, I sort of hinted at, I, I come from a, a, a different experience. My my people were were founders of communities. They uh, they founded the first black town in Alabama, part my, my mother's family, my father's family founded a, an all black settlement where they went and so on. And I grew up in that environment where they 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 didn't get a, a the, the county wouldn't give them a school they built their own school they built you know they they educated their own pe people to be I was taught by my cousins and so on it's such a different story and I think it it complicates the issue to say and this is in this is in a, a part well it's flat I don't think we you call it the South people have always told me you don't, you don't know anything about the South you didn't come from the South but I always say yes I did. In any event, uh, it complicates the story. You know, there was, of course, people were lynched and all these other kinds of things that we hear about, but that's not the whole story. It, mm -hmm. It's about a story about a man who, 
who uh, interacted with other white farmers like he did because they all there was no difference between them except that their skin was black and some skin was white or whatever the case might be. And I'm not trying to say that horrible things didn't happen, but it's just a different experience. When I, you know, when I, um, and in my, the, the only time in my entire life in this country, as old as I am, that I've ever, was ever called out of my name was in Reading, Massachusetts. I'm going to just say it right now on, 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 for the world to hear. That's the only time I ever heard something nasty and out of turn being, me being called. And, and I went to school in France. I mean, I went, I mean, I was in Finland walking around, you know, the, I, mean, I came, the Soviet Union, you name the place. I've been there walking around by myself and the kids didn't even look at me. I'm saying, oh, they're going to look at me. I mean, they're not, they're not going to be used to this black woman. They didn't even look, you know, because they weren't that concerned. Well, oh, there were black student, black uh, Africans who went to school there, but they, they saw me as, you know, a, a professor, a middle-class woman, whatever, that's how they you were going into these museums and, and so on and so forth. So that was the story. I tell you what I've experienced, what I experienced. Again, this is a, co it complicates issues among people in Africa itself. I, as an outsider, even though my skin is black, even though I am uh, African descended, I, I have been called uh, Yovo uh, and uh, uh, Nasada. And you know these terms, I think, uh, uh, Lene. Yeah, Nasada. I was called a tuba. Uh, <laughs> Nasada, and it had nothing to do with the color of my skin so much as my culture. I he said, Madame, it's not about the fact that your skin is black like ours, you know, but you you don't speak your language, i.e., this language here, you should be speaking it because you speak the white man's, the colonizer's language. That is why we call you Nasada, because it's not meant to be nasty or anything like that. But you are you are Nasada because you speak the Nasada language. You know, or you are your vote, not because of the color of your skin, but because you you am, you are a product of their culture. I mean, you know, you speak their language. That that's the, that is the defining issue, and didn't mean anything. It's just something to point out. The kids would say, "Oh, you know, you know, bonjour Nasada, bonjour Yovo, or whatever the case might be." And but you know, and especially those who were, were more of a mixed you know mixed color than I am, or whatever. But it was never anything. That meant was meant to be nasty, except the the very um, you know the the most honorable uh, connection. Um, going to school with so many girls uh, in France, um, a South African white girl who was a friend. <laughs> I mean, I was friends with everybody. I tried to be, you know. I I got in the middle of a of, of you know a conflict between Israeli and Egyptian Egyptian friends of mine. I love both of them. They put the two of them in a room together. They they were constantly at each other's us, and I said, well, why wouldn't, why did you do that kind of thing? It's just so different experience. And this, the girl from South Africa, would, she would irritate me so by saying, oh, you're so different from our girls. Said, what do you mean different from your girls and who are your girls? Anyhow, and that kind of thing to say, you know, why would you say that to me? Do you know what I mean? And, and you don't own any girls or whatever. And if I were in South Africa, you wouldn't say that to me. Not at that particular time anyway. This is before... The, the the bridges fell down or whatever the case might be. So uh, I just think it's so, so different. Like I said, I, I never had anybody say two words to me in Russia, never had anybody say two words to me in Finland, all these places I've been in Europe and so on, or, or, or anything of that nature. Um, I mean, I, there's family, obviously I have French family. I mean, you know, I can't, the experience is very different. Uh, but the conflicts that arose were just con conflicts between, let, let's say, um, husband and wife, but not anything about color or anything of that nature. Not, I'm not trying to say that they're not racist. Of course they are, okay, naturally. Uh, but uh, it just goes to show that here with just three women only and the, the vast experience, di experiential differences that we've had. So to try to close off conversation that, and to characterize everything as critical race theory, what we're talking about here is not critical race theory. It's about experiences. It's about our lives and how we grew up as, as, as women, young black girls and so on and so forth. You know, and to to try to hide that conversation, to hide the story of Claudine Colvin, or to hide the stories of you know the the millions of young black children that were forced marched across this country to build the Cotton Empire. I'm not going to hide that story, no matter how much trouble I might get in in my classes. You know, because it's it's a part of the story of America. 
So and it's a part of the atonement that we have to, we, we have to, you know, have to make. We have to atone to those children. To they are our ancestors, you know, and, and we stand on their shoulders. Uh, and so um, and, and just to show how horrible it can be, one one of my aunts uh, was a was a nanny for um, a, a white family, and the little boy loved her so. He loved her so. Uh, he he would tell everybody, "I love her," and I won't call her name. But I, I'll just say Mary. I love Mary better than anybody. I love Mary better than you. I love Mary, and he would just go around the room, telling everybody how much he loved Mary so much. And then he had a grandfather or somebody who came and told him, "You can't love her because she's an N." You know, you can't love Mary. She's an N. And he was so shattered. He just didn't know what to say. He came screaming to my aunt saying, Mary, you can't be an N. You can't be. You can't be. You have to be white. You can't be. You can't be. I love you. You can't be. And 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 she said she just couldn't stand it. And so she just left. But this is how you how you mess up the lives of children, black and white. Mm. You see, that was his the person he loved the most in the world. I don't know what happened to him. I don't think he did very well, you know, in his life. I don't know if he finished high school or whatever. We kind of lost contact with him, but she didn't want to see him suffer. And so she left and that made it even worse. So ra racism, the, the atonement that we need to give is not always just to black people. You know, it's to white children whose lives we've ruined also because they loved somebody black or whatever. Uh, and because we we messed up their trajectory of, of humanity, uh, there they, 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 you know, they're confused or whatever the case might be. So I say that just to say that the experiences that we have to tell and the, uh, the attempt at, uh, at spiritual atonement and, um, uh, at atonement and, and apology and restitution that we need to make reciprocity that we need to give is vast and challenging, but also exciting. And some of us want to be a part of it. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all so you. much. This is uh, this is very, very powerful. And I appreciate it uh, very, very deeply. Uh, and uh, as we close, uh, Joyce, why don't you just give us a quick heads up about your next session? Okay. Uh, yeah. So the next session is on the 15th. And that is going to be another occasion for an exciting group of, of women. Um, this will be um, but just, just a quote from Coretta Scott King, who says, when fear rushed in, I learned how to hear my heart racing, but refused to allow my feelings to sway me. The resili That resilience come from my family. It flowed through my bloodline. It's really not different from what we've talked about now. Uh, so we're going to uh, have um, uh, three extraordinary women, uh, one from the US and two from um, out of the country. One is from the Gambia in West Africa, Dr. Siga Fatima Jain, who was uh, formerly the commissioner of social and gender affairs at ECOWAS. And then we have um, Ms. Esther Stanford Kosi, who is with the Stop the Manga um, uh, in uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, then uh, Dr. Felicity Crawford, who is from, actually, she's, I'm sorry, all from, she's from, uh, I think she's from uh, Guyana, I believe. So we have an international group of women, uh, and that promises to be an exciting kind of synergy um, for Wednesday. So please tune in. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Linnea and Akia, Joyce. This has been just, thank you, thank you, thank you. So that'll bring us uh, to a close, everyone. Tomorrow is Valentine's. I want to wish everybody happy Valentine's Day. And in honor of that, we're going to have a session on the Black Madonna. We're going to have a collage of images from one of the doctoral students' uh, work uh, here at Ubiquity University on the Black Madonna. So we thought that would be a, a way to support what uh, uh, Joyce has been doing in terms of bringing Black voices together. Uh, so that's how we'll commemorate uh, Valentine's uh, tomorrow. Then we'll rejoin Joyce and her colleagues on Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome to the after session chat group. You'll see the link uh, in the chat box. We'll see you all tomorrow. Happy Valentine's. Bye for now. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So 